All right. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Jones Milestone Accelerator Pitch Demo 2022. Uh, we're excited to have you here, and we're really excited to showcase our teams tonight. Um, I'm Marie Mays. I am the director of the Center for Entrepreneurship, and the Center for Entrepreneurship is all things co-curricular around entrepreneurship on campus. We're a resource hub for students who have ideas, who want to move their projects to the next step, uh, who are interested in getting engaged. We're there with resources and all kinds of things to support you along that journey. And I'm Tiff Reese. Well, let's see. If my, do I exist? There you I'm go. I'm Tiff Reese, and I am, I'm the assistant director. Um, and I was realizing when I did this today, I do have more than one sweater. So uh, <laughs> just, uh, just, just wanted to let, let you know that. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, I also uh, added an extra slide in here for, for Marie and myself. Um, in some entrepreneurial circles around here on campus, Marie and I are sometimes known, for those of you who are old enough to know the Muppets, as uh, Statler and Waldorf. Um, clearly, I'm the tall, thin one. Uh, but uh, uh, these are two judges from the Muppets that can't ever agree on uh, how the show went. So we'll see how this one goes, goes today, OK? So anyway. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about what entrepreneurship is to me. Um, when I, when I uh, think about entrepreneurship, I really think about it being a mindset. Um, entrepreneurs, are, entrepreneurs are the change makers in the world. We see the problems. Um, we see how things can be better. Um, and entrepreneurs are the ones who have the, the will and the wherewithal to kind of go against the grain and uh, push against systems and what's popular to, to make things better. So entrepreneurship is really a mindset. Uh, so I think that in programs like this, a JMA program, this is what makes them so special because we have young people who see the way that things can be better and are here to actually solve problems and throw themselves out there to, to do that. So I've really enjoyed working with the um, uh, students today, or students this summer. Um, so student ventures that are presenting today are important because they showcase what's possible. Uh, but we wanted you to know, like I said earlier, that entrepreneurship and the Center for Entrepreneurship is, is more uh, than just kind of the, the final venture launch, right? That it's about a mindset, that, that we offer programs for first and second year students. Some of you, I think, here are in our Joan Sparks program. Um, and we offer programs all the way up to what we do tonight. And so we just want to say that we're grateful to the Carson College of Business that supports what we do um, and also enables us to reach out all across campus to students of all majors to help them move their idea to the next phase. Um, and so I want to thank the Christ College of Business and all the donors who support our, our outreach to students all across campus. Yeah, so um, I want to talk a little bit about what we're going to do today and then we're going to bring uh, the Dean uh, Chip Hunter up to, to, to talk. Um, so we're going to do some, some basic um, introductions now and then we're going to have the four teams present. Uh, we have four teams, Ag Rooted, Gut Check, um, Queso and Solar Blades, and uh, each team will present for 10 minutes and then have eight minutes of uh, uh, time with the judges, and then we have two minute, a two-minute transition time between, between the teams. So please um, hold applause until the end of the presentations, and if you have to run the restroom, please uh, do that during the two. You have two minutes to do that during, during, during the break, okay? So... Um, uh, and with that, I think uh, I'll also I want to talk a little bit about before we have um, the dean come up. Um, what, for both for the judges and the mentors, um, we uh, we did get you all a little thank you gift. Uh, so if uh, if you you should you should have that there, um, or pick it up on the way out if you have if you're a mentor or a judge, be sure to get that before you um, before you leave today. So with that, I think we'll turn it over to to the dean and let him come up and 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 uh, say a few words. Thanks, Marie. Thanks, Tiff. Uh, unlike Tiff, I only have one quarter zip, um, but I, uh, I decided to wear it today, partly because I have a team retreat. Usually, I'm in a coat and tie Monday through Thursday, but I had a team retreat today. But also, I you know, thought I should dress like our entrepreneurs, and I don't think the WSU entrepreneurs will get caught wearing a tie these days. It's not how we roll, um, unless you really need to put one on, and then we will, because we'll do what it takes. And to the teams themselves, I really want to congratulate you for all the hard work you've done in getting your, um, your, your ideas to the space they're in now with the potential for impact going forward. It's pretty exciting for us. Um, 
every year it's exciting. Uh, this year, probably uh, especially exciting as we, we bounce back out of, uh, after some years where we had a hard time gathering ourselves, we couldn't have meetings like this, couldn't show our whole faces. We're really excited, um, I think all of us um, across WSU and in the Carson College to, to be here together to uh, uh, watch some the product of some great work and uh, celebrate it as well. Um, we couldn't do it without our sponsors. Uh, tonight there are a couple I want to thank. The Herbert G. B. Jones Foundation, which has been a, a big sponsor of the you know, namesake, the Jones uh, Milestone Accelerator, uh, and, and, and Mike Bauer uh, of Jones, who's, who's always been a champion of, of the work of the, the Center for Entrepreneurship, Marie and, and her team. Also, the Lee and Hayes Law Firm um, has been with us for, for a while as well. Uh, they're a law firm that specializes in the business of IP and, and been great friends to the, the Carson College, its, its students, and, and WSU in general as well. Um, so again, from the, from the Carson College, th thanks to the sponsors. And um, then, at least as important as sponsors are those of you who served as mentors. Um, thank you very much. The Carson College uh, is increasingly committed to having our students learn through experience, but just doing things doesn't help unless you have someone um, who's going to help you reflect on the doing and what you've learned from the doing. And our faculty, our great team, Tiff, Marie, everybody can, can do a lot of that, but there's nothing like having mentors who have been, been there and done that and continue to do that to work with them as well. So we really, really appreciate what what you're doing the Carson College some of you know some of you may not um, we're the with the business college um, here at WSU um, we've had the Carson name for about eight years now um, named for Scott and Linda Carson and their family who have been very generous to the college uh, and really role models for for many of us we do more undergraduate business degrees than anybody in the Pacific Northwest not a commonly known fact but we're the biggest um, we also like to think we're the best particularly as we've reinvented our undergraduate graduate program in the Carson College to place more emphasis, as I mentioned, on, the, on learning through experience, on learning actively, and on um, working closely with, with faculty and staff to make sure that you get hands-on chance to figure out what it is you need to know. Um, but that's not the only thing we do in the Carson College. We, we don't just educate business majors. We have a major in entrepreneurship, and um, it's an exciting major for those who are interested in it. But entrepreneurship itself is actually critical to the success of the college well beyond just the success of the students who major in entrepreneurship. In fact, as um, a college, we have only a few strategic goals. One of them is to be a national leader in bringing, bringing business education to students well beyond the, the walls of the College of Business. One of the reasons we're located with our entrepreneurship center in the Commons rather than Todd Hall is we want to make sure that all students know that they are 100% welcome to join the Center for Entrepreneurship to work with Marie and Tiff and the team to bring their ideas forward. We really want to be a space where students from every program, every major, undergraduates, graduates alike, are able to find a home, a place to meet, um, find potential collaborators, people to bounce ideas off of. You don't have to be a business major to be passionate about entrepreneurship. In fact, if you look at the range of entrepreneurs who've been successful across the country for hundreds of years, a few of them are business majors, and many are just people with a great idea and maybe a little bit of common sense, a willingness to learn from experience, and then um, a lot of determination and drive. But a little bit of organized learning can go a long way, and that's why we really want to focus on providing these experiences through the Center for Entrepreneurship. It's a fantastic uh, program for WSU, um, all of the stuff that we're offering in the center, and it's something that's very important to the college, has been for years, and will be more important going forward. Uh, there's a bit of a lull nationally these days in entrepreneurial energy. You can see it in the data. That's not good for the country, and uh, it's not good for our state and region either. And so the fact that we're here working with budding entrepreneurs, we've got a lot of involvement from experienced entrepreneurs and, and, and mentors willing to give their time is really going to be critical to the success of not just our college or WSU, um, but the region and perhaps the country at, 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 you know, writ large over the next decade. And so what we do, I think, um, really matters a lot. Uh, we're very committed to it. And so again, I want to thank um, the teams for their hard work, our team in the center, 
our mentors and our sponsors for uh, getting us to tonight. And with that, I will uh, uh, turn the program uh, back over to Tiff, who will keep us moving um, through the evening. Thank you. Um, thanks. Thanks, Dean Hunter. Um, so I'm going to ask the judges if you wouldn't mind um, introducing yourselves. Do you want to come up here for just a second and I'll let you introduce? They can do it from here? Okay. All right. Oh, that's right. You have a microphone. Sorry. I guess I'll go first. Um, thank you guys for having us. We're excited to be here. Uh, my name is Daler Youngblood. I'm an associate at Peleon Venture Partners. Uh, if you don't know who we are, it's because a lot of people don't. Uh, VC is kind of a niche, small thing a lot of people don't know about, uh, especially at your guys' age, but you should. I think it's a great thing. It's an amazing. I love what I do. Um, Peleon, what we do, we invest in early stage companies all across the U.S. Uh, we're based in Salt Lake City, Utah, so we do a ton in Utah. Uh, but we've done New York, Texas, Boise, Washington, you name it. Um, we invest in Seed Series A. We are actually investing out of a $370 million fund. It is the biggest fund in Utah. Subtle brag for you guys. Um, but yeah, we invest in anything software. We love helping out. We love being a part of this program, helping you guys out. Um, ask us anything you want after. Uh, hopefully we can answer all your questions, but uh, we're here to help you guys. So take full advantage of it. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Michelle Armstrong and I'm with SP3 Northwest. We are the early stage life science business incubator out of Washington State University, the Spokane campus. We help budding entrepreneurs uh, sustain their momentum. We do this through mentoring within the i program and then moving on with mentorship, uh, executive advisors, uh, startup consultants to help with the personnel costs, as well as a number of different programs to equip you for the things that are ancillary to your business um, and tangential. So love to hear the presentations tonight and looking forward to working with you further. Hello, happy to be here. Thank you guys for having me. My name is uh, Connor Simpson. I work with uh, Limelight Technology Group. We are a custom software development consulting shop. Uh, build things from down from the ground floor of startups, work with big enterprise fight Fortune 500 companies, do a ton of work in the background investigation space as well as the title space. Uh, also own a company uh, called Tools Group where we sell tools to the background inve investigation space and the title space. And uh, also involved in a lot of things entrepreneurial here in town. I know some of the teams that are here are uh, from Sparks Weekend, so happy to sit here uh, and see them uh, and hear about the progress, as well as uh, Spokane uh, Young Professionals, which is an event that we actually met uh, Ag Roots over here uh, at recently, so uh, looking forward to hearing everything. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you all for uh, participating in, in the program. Um, so again, uh, 10 minute presentations, eight minutes for Q&A with the judges. Um, I'm gonna hold up signs at five minutes and one minute. And then if you all um, go over 10 minutes, I'm gonna, I'm gonna football tackle you and push you off the stage. But no, I, I'll, I'll, I'll politely try to get you to, to, to stop. Um, so with that, I think we're ready, right? Um, so I need to cut this off. And um, the first uh, presenting team is Team AgRooted with uh, Jessica and Sean Murray. Hello everyone, and thank you for coming. My name is Jessica Murray, and I am the CEO and co-founder of AgRooted. I also just finished my PhD and a focus on local food and agricultural tourism, and this is the third venture I've been a part of. My name is Sean Murray. I'm going to be finishing my mechanical engineering degree this December, and I am the COO for AgRooted. Sean and I both grew up on a family-owned farm in southwest Washington. Our grandparents had thousands of people a year come to the farm to learn about what we do, see our animals, hang out, have event spaces, and we really want to make it easier for people to come and have these experiences at farms across the country. So, ag tourism. If you've ever been to a farm for a pumpkin patch, horseback ride, wine tasting, wedding event, you've experienced ag tourism. There's thousands of farms across the United States that provide these unique events for consumers. 
But there's a problem with agricultural tourism. It can be hard to find as a consumer. You have to see the street sign, you have to be on the right Facebook page, or know the local area well to find these unique events. And for farmers, it can be difficult to start into agricultural tourism because you need to build an online web presence, have the capital to start that website and drive traffic to it. Also, as family farms are aging, we've noticed a generational shift from the older generation to the younger generation. This has shown that commodity sales that they might have been doing may not be as valuable and be able to keep the farm going as good. So agricultural tourism is another method for them to make revenue and keep the family farm in the family. And AgRooted is the solution to both of these problems. We are creating a platform where we can bring the consumers and the farmers together so that consumers can find these unique experiences and farmers can provide them and have easy booking capability. So we are connecting consumers and farmers through one unique experience at a time. The AgroTourism tourism industry in the United States is at approximately a billion dollars according to the USDA Agricultural Census of 2017. However, the agricultural census in 2017 did not include wineries. They just decided they weren't going to be included, so that number is definitely an underestimate. Globally, it's at about 69 billion and it is expanding rapidly. COVID-19 has actually been really good for agricultural tourism. In my dissertation research, I found that people wanted to find activities that were not in urban areas. They wanted to leave the urban areas. They also have a really good sense of nostalgia for farms, even if they've never had a personal connection. So really fostering that sense of experience and giving them experiences that are appealing in this day and age. We've also found that nine out of 10 people that I surveyed had been to a farm for some sort of experience in the last year and plan to go again next year. We have a twofold customer base. We have both our farmers or our ag agricultural operators and we have our consumers. Farmers, in that agricultural census, there were 28,000 farmers that said that they were actively making money from agricultural tourism. Of all the farmers I've talked to, two filled that out. Everyone else promptly threw it in the trash. So this number is a way underestimate and it didn't include the wineries. There's also approximately two million family-owned farms in the United States. So there's a lot of farms that are positioned to move into this space. Consumers, like I said, they're looking for these unique experiences, and we're seeing that this is really popular with millennials, Gen Z. We're also finding that the older generations want to bring their grandkids out. So bring their grandkids and let them have a unique experience they may not have had, especially if they're from an urban area. But what are we really doing for these two customer bases? For farmers, we're lowering that barrier of entry into the agritourism space. We're making it easier for them to enter this space and have increased revenue. We're also helping give them some market insights and trends in the industry on the back end if they become one of our members. And we're creating a place for them to have a sense of community and to create connections with the public and with their fellow farmers. For the consumers, we're making it easier to find and know what you can do in the agricultural space and really finding these experiences. We're also providing some agricultural education opportunities. We have a forward facing blog where we can go ahead and teach them about agriculture and make sure that it's not as scary or unfamiliar. We can really make it so that people know where their food is coming from, make it comfortable again. And then again, we're building community and we're building connections for these people, giving them an access point. And our platform is going to be launching in 20 days. So, for wintertime, we're going to be onboarding farms, and then in spring, we're going to be doing a public advertising campaign to bring consumers to the site. But if you were to show up to our site, you would have your choice of looking at experiences, stays, or spaces on a farm setting. Also, like Jessica mentioned, we have a forward-facing blog that can create educational tools for uh, the industry, and we have a back section blog where farms can learn tips, tricks, taxes, everything it takes to build a strong business in agricultural tourism. And if we look at some of our competitors in our space, the number one competitor we have right now is Airbnb. Farms can host stays there and experiences, but there's been recent backlash with Airbnb and the sticker shock that you have when you go to check out. Their rates are extremely high and we are having a lower commission rate. Farm Stays USA doesn't have the features required to have an all-in-one stop. Harvest Host doesn't actually directly support the farmers. They encourage guests to buy at the farm, but they don't support the farmers directly. And Ag Tourism World is a database. Farmish is like the Craigslist of product sales on a farm, and then Facebook and regional sites and offerings. 
As it currently stands, AgRooted is the only option for a one-stop shop where you can go and find agricultural experiences, stays, or venues and book them in the same place. We have a three-phase go-to-market plan. In phase one, which is starting in 20 days, but which we've really actually started, we're targeting farms that are already in the agritourism industry and onboarding them into our site and really building that presence as the premier go-to spot for agritourism experiences. In phase two, we're going to expand our accessibility and move to not just have our online mobile accessible website, but also have phone applications where you can use that both on Android and iPhone. And then we are also going to be selling products on the farm. So I went to a tea farm in Hawaii, had a beautiful time there, got to walk around and see it, and I bought some tea and brought it home. Unfortunately, I can't go to tea Hawaii this weekend. I would love to, but I don't have the time. But if I could go to the same website where I booked that experience and order some tea shipped to me, that would be a really great reminder of that experience, and it would help her have revenue in the off season. In phase three, we're gonna help farms transition into the agritourism space and expand internationally. We have a hybrid business model, slightly different from previous competitors. We have a $25 per month farm membership fee. So to be on the platform, have a farm presence and have their experiences listed, that's $25 a month. We also have a 10% commission basis. We have a 5% convenience fee on the consumer side, and we have a 5% fee that we take from the farmer side when they book through a paid booking. We also cover all credit card processing fees. And then we have a couple other supplementary forms of revenue, including blog posts. So if the Washington Wheat Commission wanted to put out some information about the wheat industry, they could post that in a sponsored blog post. We also have sponsored postings if you want to bump your farm to the top of the list and doing some branded merchandising as well. In our five-year financial projections, obviously we had to make some assumptions. So I took that agricultural census, which we've already established is a bit of an underestimate. They said those farms were making $33,000 per year from agricultural tourism. To be very conservative on our estimates, I said they were making $5,000 a year. And I said that by year five, we would have captured 50% of that physically measured market. So 14,000 farms would be on our site by year five. We also have our primary expenses here, including web hosting, web development, and credit card processing fees. We have each personally put $10,000 of personal equity into the venture already for a total of 20,000. And we're gonna be seeking an additional $100,000 of investor funding. This is gonna to go to our early onboarding of customers and website development and floating expenses through year one. With the Jones Milestone Accelerator, uh, many, many doors have been opened to us. <clears throat> They have given us great access to mentorship. They've helped us with guidance and they've also helped us and shown the importance of customer discovery. We've also gone ahead and started our beta testing. We've distributed those surveys and in that process, we've started to onboard farms. Only one farm said that they weren't interested right now. Every single other farm was very interested in being part of this website. Uh, we've also been able to establish our legal standing and move forward with some strategic guidance from the director of our JMA program. We also have some key takeaways. We obviously knew networking was important. We learned that throughout university, but we really learned that it was extremely important through this. Every single week we met with five to seven new people, had meetings, learned what they could contribute, and our mentors were a big part of that. We'd like to thank Aziz, Rich French, and Amanda Severson for all their hard effort and help they've given us mentors. We would also like to thank Tiffany Reese, the director of the JMA program, Dr. Marie Mays, the director of the Entrepreneurship Center, and our big takeaway was no matter where you're at, tell everyone who you are and what you're doing. We'd like to thank you for coming and join AgRooted in thinking local everywhere. Is there any questions? I have a couple questions. Um, so one, uh, the idea that you would be able to capture 50% of the self-reported agritourism tourism by year five, um, what data supports that you would be able to capture 50%, that's a, a very large percent, and do you have an idea of uh, the cost per customer or Yes, so we actually have kind of a plan for recruiting these farmers. Um, obviously we think that number is low, so it would 
that's truly 50% is going to be less than that because that market is actually much larger than it has been measured by the USDA. Um, and based on the farms that we have talked to, we've had one out of several dozen say that they were not interested. Right now, there isn't a place for them. So they're looking for something to make this a lot easier for them because they want to be making revenue from this. And we have kind of a variety of ways we're going to contact them. Yeah, so if you look at this list here, this is some of our networking we've done with local farm communities to onboard farms. We are approaching a grassroots system of onboarding farms, and we also have a strong referral program with our platform. So if you refer a farm, each farm will get one month free subscription. With that, we are also distributing our recruitment materials via each agricultural extension office from all of the land-grant universities, which WSU is one of. Uh, we're reaching out through the Idaho, to Idaho Tourism Board, the Washington Hospitality Association, um, different agricultural groups. I'm also part of several agricultural Facebook groups where we've been discussing this as we build it and getting feedback from farmers. So it is an optimistic number, but we think we can definitely hit it. Thank you very much. When you guys look at the farmers you have or are going to talk to, where do you think is the best location to get these farmers? And then on the customer side, do you think that contributes them to be the best customers? Do you think there's best, more, a better place customers don't know about it yet? Are you talking about geographically? Okay. Yeah. So geographically, this is something I've seen in my research. Um, if you are a farm closer to the coasts, you do have a larger percentage of population that can come to you and visit you. So those are very large. Um, when you go to Hawaii, a lot of people think about the beaches, but Hawaii actually has a huge farming community and there's a lot of things you can do. You can go to a tea farm, you can go to an orchid farm. Um, so I think that one has a lot of room for expansion. And then the central of the center of the country is actually seeing a lot of growth as people want to get away from the coasts a little bit. We see the beach all the time if we live down near the beach. We want to go into the middle of the country, really discover what the United States is. And so we're seeing urban people move that direction for their vacations, which is a trend away from traditional tourism. But as we move into the sustainable tourism, we are seeing more of that. You are gonna have a higher mass on the coasts though. Awesome, thanks. Are you, uh, you mentioned Airbnb as one of your competitors. Are you gonna allow dual posting, being able to sync the calendars between those two platforms so that you don't have to be exclusively using one? Yes, we are. So it is one thing we've planned in so that they have that functionality. Um, and the idea is that if they're on both, we would like to convince them over time that we're providing a better service for them. But they would be able to sync their calendars between both, as well as hip camp if they are providing camping spaces on the farm. Very cool. How do you guys think about the seasonality of the business? Because I think everyone's going to want to visit Nebraska in the summer, but I'm not going in the winter. So <laughs> no. you guys yes. Think about that? Um, so we recognize that the market for agricultural tourism is extremely seasonal and we have plotted that out on which months are going to be higher and which ones are going to be lower. To do that, we are going to offer a yearly subscription discount for our farmers so that they can be on the site the whole time. Also, it's valuable to the farms to stay on the site because as they're in the back end of the site looking at the forums, tips, tricks, they can be working on next season to see how they can improve. It also shows their availability and such. So if people are planning trips for the summer, they can go onto their listings and start booking things as they're going on. Once we have product sales as well, let's say you're a pumpkin farmer, but you grow specialty pumpkins or specialty gourds. If there's a demand for it, now maybe you grow some gourds and we turn them into decorative dried gourds, we turn them into birdhouses, and you sell them on the platform through the winter and extend your season and extend your revenue. Curious on that note too, um, are you guys considering doing like uh, having your platform allow for events too? Because it seems like a lot of these farms we write for, you know, booking out for weddings, reunions, and things of that nature. <laughs> Yes, uh, our platform currently provides for events, stays, and spaces, event spaces, whether that's weddings, any other type of thing, you can post that on the farms. I'm curious how you've talked about the farmers that have shown interest. How many have pre-booked subscriptions? So as of this point, we were not letting anybody on board because we wanted to make sure it was a fully functional platform. We've created a database of all the farms that have said that they're interested and starting next month, we're going to reach out to them. They're going to get an introductory period since we aren't advertising it to everybody right at the beginning where they're not paying a subscription. We're just working out those glitches, kind of doing that beta test. We didn't want to start right into pumpkin season. October is the busiest season and that felt like potential train wreck. So we're going to onboard them slowly through the fall and winter in the spring, start pushing our marketing campaign to consumers, really bring people to the platform, and then we will start doing our standard subscription service. 
and then continuing that snowball enrollment where if it was working great for you, tell your friend across the street, you both get another free month. So we are expecting very low subscription revenue in year one to then be moving up in year two as they move off of those um, complimentary subscriptions. So what do you guys explain to us like the onboarding process for these farms and the vetting process? Because if they say, hey, we have a roller coaster, you're just going to let people go. You're going to go yeah. vet them. Exactly. Yeah. So what we're doing to start with is we're targeting farms in the agricultural tourism space already. So our quality of our experiences and spaces are high. They come onto the site, they fill out a forum with a story, a personable story about the farm, pictures of the farm, what kind of things they're offering. And then we look at that application and then we approve or deny the application. If we deny it, we're going to sit down and talk with them like, hey, we'd like to talk about this, that, how can we improve and work to make sure your farm is as best experience for everyone that can visit you. It's awesome. We also have review integration. So obviously if farms are getting poor reviews, that'll show up. And then we can kind of intervene and talk with them about what can we pivot? What is not working well on your farm? What could we change before we take action to remove them if it becomes a continuing problem? Got it. I was curious, I know um, in the early days at Airbnb, they kind of have a white glove service where they help, you know, take the pictures and write the descriptions. Is that something, because I know uh, specifically in this space, I see you've got organic nearby. Uh, so I'm familiar with yes. the types of people that use these types of uh, technologies and sometimes they're a little tech adverse. Is there, I, I heard you have some tips on there. Is there something, you know, above and beyond that you might offer to uh, really make those? Uh, yeah, stand out? so first we're gonna create informative videos on how to create a good story. We're also gonna offer copywriting services where farmers can fill out a list the questions and talk, you, talk with a copywriter to make that excellent bio that really tells their farm story. Uh, we're also giving them some tips and tricks about it. We found that if you include a photo with somebody's faces, so somebody who works on the farm, whether it's the owner or the workers on the farm, that really brings that personable touch in and really driving home that community aspect really makes this much more impactful. So yes, we are doing that. And then part of our marketing campaign that launches in the spring is us traveling to farms and creating content both for our social media campaigns, but then also for them. And one thing we've included in our terms and conditions on the backside is that any photos that get uploaded as reviews or things like that, we then have access to and can use on our site. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to introduce um, Team Gut Check. This is Aniston Denkla, Kiernan Denk, Denk, Denkla, Denkla. Uh, um, Matthew Pand, and Savannah Dozier. Yes. <laughs> All right, there we go. <laughs> awesome. Well, have, hello, everyone. As you know, my name is Aniston, and it's great to be back here presenting for you in Pullman, Washington. We are going to be telling you the story of Gut Check. The future of health and fitness apps is here. So Gut Check started as an idea in one of my entrepreneurship classes last year. My professors told me to find something I was passionate about and to roll with it. Well, roll with it I did. I always had a, knew that fitness and nutrition were very important to me, especially growing up in sports, but I never understood why I felt so bad after eating something I considered healthy. Well, it was come to find out years later, I was actually sensitive to that product. And a few months after I came up with this idea, we and my sister and I ended up in Wazoo's Carson College Business Co Plan Competition and took third place. Let's go. <laughs> but it did bring us here today. That competition not only showed me how hard a startup would be, but how I could absolutely do it one day. But I knew I couldn't do it with just my sister and I, so I had to expand our team a little bit. So as you can see, we have two new faces up here, Matthew and Savannah. We all have a business background, and I also have a science background, but we are act actively trying to expand our team into the computer science realm. We are fortunate enough to be a part of Wazoo's computer science capstone classes, and we have two teams helping us develop and build our app for this year. But let's get into the gut of Gut Check. So what's the problem that we're here to solve? Well, over 35 distinct health issues have been linked to food sensitivities. There's that affect over 1 billion people. That's over 20% of the world population. A diet that triggers an internal inflammation response from a food sensitivity could be lead to symptoms such as chronic headaches, um, allergies, extreme gastrointestinal issues, um, imbalance of hormones, and many more. Not only that, 
There's no app out there or platform that currently conducts testing, analysis, and personalizes any of the features towards your food sensitivity results. I bet you guess where we're going with our solution. <laughs> well, the solution is to help people with food sensitivities through a platform that personalizes app features and dietary regimens based off of their food sensitivity results. We offer partnerships with testing centers such as Everly Well and Oxford Medicine. We will personalize every app feature towards you. We will have nutritionists and personal trainers on our staff to help you through this pro process. Not only will Gut Check tell you what foods to avoid, but will also maximize your health by, telling, by personalizing everything towards you. Leading us to our value proposition of our app helps people with food sensitivities who want to reduce their unwanted symptoms by offering a per personalized nutrition app based off their food sensitivity results. Who are we marketing? Too. Well, we're marketing to food sensitivity sufferers. <laughs> Sorry, um, that's about about 20% of the world's population, as Aniston stated earlier. From our customer discovery, we've learned that these people are people who have had taken food sensitivity tests before, those who just have had gut history, like they went and got tested and found out that they actually can't have a lot of foods, or people who have done food or nutrition or fitness tests and they're just over them and no longer want to do this. So that dwindles down our numbers between ages of 25 to 45. These are people that have disposable incomes, millennials, or people that just really want to take that next step forward in their life and to better help themselves. Well, what is our competition? Well, we know that our competition is really anybody in the nutrition or fitness market. This is a very saturated market. Some of our top competitors are MyFitnessPal or Foodicate. Both companies that offer a lot of um, options for nutrition, but what they don't offer and why a lot of people actually do leave this app is because it's not personalized. They've noticed that with us, we actually personalize every single thing in the app to make it better for you and personalized to you. Uh, with our go with our go-to market, we wanted to be unique and sleek with the process. Um, in order to do so, we needed to do a lot of research beforehand. Um, first, we needed to identify our niche uh, market, um, which is functional health, gut health, nutrition, fitness, and wellness. Um, we as a team came together and met up and decided to discuss our image and what our branding we wanted to do for our company. And we ended up coming up with a mood board slash vision board of what we wanted our company to look and feel like. Um, the next step we took after that was to conduct a customer discovery and beta testing program. Um, we started out with interviewing our peers and our ideal target group. Um, each interview consisted of 10 to 15 questions each uh, to gain information that would help us narrow down our target market. Um, as we continued to do these interviews, we also started doing our beta testing on August 1st. Uh, we chose individuals ranging from different ages, ethnicities, daily schedules, and different weights. And they went through a program and process that uh, had a personal nutritionist and an elimination diet. Um, our next step was to create our branding and advertising campaign. Uh, we have the layouts and designs for our social media and website and our digital advertisements that we would like to put out. Um, we are targeting uh, some social media at the moment due to the data we've gathered. Um, we will use media forms such as Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, um, and our website. We hope to use the additional funding from the JMA to start this process. So how does Gut Check earn money? Well, we have three levels of sub subscriptions. Healthy Habits, which unlocks the nutrition side of the app. Optimal Health, which unlocks the fitness side of that and resilience program, which gives you a personal trainer and a nutritionist. However, you can always add a personal trainer or nutritionist to both of the other subscriptions just with the additional fee. With our expected revenue, in the middle we see a large jump at year three because we are going to launch the resilience program and the optimal health program. But at year five, we expect to have 15,000 subscribers, making us $4.1 million. So let's really get into why we're all here today, and it's to talk about the JMA. Well, through this JMA, we had about six to eight-ish milestones that we were lucky enough to complete in this time frame, with number one to be to conduct slash compete, complete a beta test. Now, this beta test actually is ending this week for our participants, 
And we had two key takeaways. The number one was this elimination diet that we put these our beta testers on works. Their symptoms reduced, and, the, and then there's evidence to show that if they continue in longevity, that we could eliminate all their symptoms in the future. And the second one, though, is timing is everything. Nobody wanted to go through a strict elimination diet in the middle of summer when everyone wanted to go on vacation. Not only does this show this timing is everything with our launch strategy, but we're probably going to aim for a new year, new me brand awareness type launch or like a spring clean. We're planning on testing this with our second beta test in the spring, hopefully with more participants. And then the second one was to become a legal entity. All I can say is we did it. We are officially got check LOC. Let's go. And um, now I can start cashing checks. So <laughs> number three, our trademark search. Good news is, is we're actively doing it. We've reached out to a couple IP lawyers and we're figuring out what is trade, uh, trademarkable and what we should trademark first. Number four is complete additional customer discovery. We have done a lot of that. And three big key takeaways is, number one, we've touched on it earlier, customization. Most of the time people leave their users because they don't want, it's not customized to them. Number two is the app is confusing. They're not going to want to surf the app and try to figure it out because it's just confusing. And number three, if the subscription is over $200, they're just not going to pay for it. So brand awareness strategy start. Where you started off a mess, I'm gonna be honest with you guys. Um, me and Kiernan had a lot of ideas. Our CEO over here was not a big fan of them. Um, so we went back and forth until we talked to our mentor, Kara, where she kind of explained to us that the like brand awareness is so important to your brand, like really important. And if you don't have your brand awareness, you can't really make anyone aware of it. Um, so as soon as that happened, we. Uh, Kiernan and I started to like think of ideas what logos how we are gonna like reach our target market kind of other ways and as soon as that happened we were gut check we became a company and we are all together uh, with our milestone number six we focused on the future um, and with that we had some big achievements with that coming up with the app update and our website creation with our app update we are in the Wazoo's computer science Vancouver and Pullman capstone classes and we hope to have a MVP by the end of May of 2023 and then with our website we learned that with the brand uh, you can't really make a website without a brand and now that we've had that um, finalized and kind of complete we plan to have a construction by the end of January and then our biggest takeaway from this is mentorship our mentors were extremely monumental in our success for this session. I shout out to Kara, Osman, and Lori. All of their input was extremely important into making us who we are today. So I just want to say thank you for everyone who participated with us in this program, and we hope to talk to you all very soon. Thank you. First question. Um, when you talk about the amount of extreme personalization that you're going to do on your app, and then you talk about simplicity of use, those typically don't hold hands very well. That is very true. I'm so happy you asked this question. <laughs> So here we see our app onboarding process. So we're trying to make the personalization aspect easy for the user itself. So as we see from the first screen with the login page, this is where you'll have your login, you create your account, and that second page is actually our code page. This is where you'll take a screenshot or upload your results into the app, and then um, as well as your subscription code. And then if you see that long list of all the extreme foods, by the way, these are my results. Um, everything red up there would actually be highlighted and would algor the algorithm would personalize every app feature to that to you. So there's no personalization in the regards to like complication for the user. It's more on our end to make sure this technology can work out for them. Can you guys walk me through, because I have no idea what a food test looks like, how to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, walk me through what that looks like and then I have a follow-up question. Okay, so for this beta test, we actually use two different types of tests. The first one was with uh, Every Well, and it is an at-home test kit that is a finger prick blood sample. This test, um, you basically squeeze blood onto a parchment and you send it back to their lab. It is an IgG antibody test, which is just in a general inflammatory reaction. So any food that they would like 
subject to your blood and that would create that reaction, they would flag as sensitive to. And depending on how sensitive it was, they put a list of abnormal. You can't really see it because the font's small, but there's little numbers next to all the abnormal. And then the second test is an MRT test, which is a mediator release test. It is a live blood test that you need with a phlebotomist in order to take. But this test also tests for additives and for, um, as well as the food. Um, but it's with a mediator release such as like histamine. So that's instead of testing for an antibody, they test for chemical reactions instead. So then my follow up question is you said all the competitors don't do the same results. Correct. Uh, talk about why you guys are partnered with them and what they'll do. Um, I see food sensitivities really take, taking off in the future with our current um, agricultural, like food um, that we're eating. Um, food sensitivities have risen the last eight years by about 40%. And um, so within, within our competitors, I think they're more focused on weight loss rather than overall health. And that's what would make us different besides the personalization. We just want you to be a healthy human being rather than saying, we can help you lose 30 pounds in 30 days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you uh, talk to me a little bit about what you're thinking in terms of like user retention? Because this app seems like it has a very well-defined goal is, you know, I'm going to understand what, you know, it disrupts my gut, what, you know, what I can't eat, what I can't eat after that. What's my incentive to continue using the app once I kind of have that uh, nailed down? would be the features we offer. So one of the, a part of our customer discovery was if the app's complicated or redundant with time use, people offboard the app, such as MyFitnessPal, you'd have to log your food every day. So within the features, we want to create things efficiently. So an example would be, we all want a grocery list feature where you can go into a recipe book, be like, okay, this week I'm eating this, this, and this. It converts it to a grocery list for you so you can just go to the store to cr help create your goals. Um, it really depends on the wellness goals. We predict if people stick to it, it will last around nine months um, before they're like completely solidified and they would only stay on for the features themselves or the personal trainer continually helping you. So I've got a question about the pricing. Um, how is it your pricing compared to your competitors' pricing? Perfect. I'm glad you asked that too. So um, from the competitor's slide, we have, we're basing our pricing off of Weight Watchers and Noom. Now Noom is about $60 a month and these are both very heavily known weight loss apps. Even though we're not a weight loss platform, we do consider them the competitor because anyone can come to us for weight loss. Um, they're just wildly known if you think about like, oh, I want to reach this goal. Here's like the person I would use. Weight Watchers though, their first program is $20 a month with no personalization. So we're basing it off of, okay, if there are no personalization, we think we can take it up to 30 and then branch out from there. Fitness Culture is another app we're using, which is a strict fitness app that shows you how to, um, shows you all programming for like different, like bodybuilding or weight loss uh, type workouts. They're $90 a month for their fitness and nutrition program. And that's what we're basing optimal health off of. And where their nutrition program themselves is just 45. And then the resilience program is based off of how much a personal trainer and a nutritionist is an hour. So nutritionists can range between 30 to $45 an hour, depending on who they are and their status. And personal trainers can go from 40 to 60, depending on, and this is the lower end, but it's depending on how well they advertise themselves and how many clients they have. So there's room for negotiation with both. But if you were a user of our app and you had um, healthy habits, but you wanted the personal trainer and the nutritionist, might as well just go to the resilience program because it would be cheaper than to add both of those on, which it's designed that way to do. So you guys talked about adding personal trainers and nutritionists. Uh, tell me what that would look like because it's great to add them, but it would kill your margins. Yes. Um, so like how many people can one trainer work with, one nutritionist, how do you guys think about that? Well, the features themselves isn't, um, it wouldn't be like a conference call. The you would have a you'd have an initial meeting with them to figure out your plan, but actually they would just send you the personalized plan weekly for you. So any work that you would do in regards to creating or building or accessorizing your plan that's already created, they would just create it and send it to you through the wellness like portal of the app. So um, if I was had a busy schedule, which I, I do right now, but I would go in and I would say, oh, nutritionist sent me my food for the week and my grocery list and my, how many calories are 
meal plan or macros I'd have to eat. Oh, personal trainer says this week I need to work four times a week, cardio two days, um, exercise or weights the other days, depending on my wellness goal. So it's more, for, and it's more for people who want to go for bodybuilding too, mm -hmm. or an extreme weight loss. Those people will help them keep on track, and they hold them accountable for as well. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Great. Actually, oh, sorry. Uh, okay. Last question. All right. So, what would prevent one of your competitors from basically adding in a sensitivity test and? getting to market faster? That is a very good question. Honestly, I think food sensitivities is still too niche for our competitors to really take a look at. Um, they definitely could, or I'm not gonna sit up here and be like, oh, they can't. They definitely could. I do think we can develop an algorithm though that could be patentable one day um, to where no one could use it, but we're still in the development stages of that now. Um, but I do think our competitors are solely focused on weight loss, not health. So I think that's where our advertisements will definitely differ. And for us to f kind of fly under the radar until we just destroy the entire health and fitness industry. <laughs> Last question. What was the most surprising food that you had sensitivity to? Oh, well, actually, we can all answer yeah. this. Go for it. You got ten, five seconds. Mine was bananas. <laughs> <laughs> Mine was rice. I was rice. so mad. Mine was chicken. I ate chicken every day for basketball. Yeah. Oh, that hurts. Yeah. I had only five. However, my biggest one was a mung bean. Yeah, <laughs> mung bean. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't even. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Thank you Thank so much. You Thank you. All right. Hi, everyone. So. By the raise of hands, who's tired of the same old greasy fast food like McDonald's, Taco Bell, and Burger King? Great, well so am I. Uh, my name is Paolo and I'm the founder of Queso. Queso is a fast casual charcuterie restaurant where you can cheese, meat, drink, and repeat. Imagine a mod pizza or chipotle for charcuterie. If you need a quick bite during lunch, come grab one of our adult Lunchables. Or if you have time to spare, enjoy a half the hour with a glass of wine or beer, along with your favorite cheeses. All right, so I'm Paolo Arquiola, and I found Queso in July of 2020 in the midst of the pandemic. And I kind of wanted to um, use my like foodie side of me and my entrepreneurial side of me and then merge it together. So um, Queso was born. I started with making charcuterie boards outside of my parents' kitchen, which is kind of illegal. <laughs> and then I uh, started putting, posting Facebook ads and Instagram ads. And then my order started to grow and grow. All right, so what is charcuterie? Um, charcuterie is actually a French term that means cured meat products. Today, the term is loosely used to describe a variety of cheese, meat, um, fruit, and more. Sometimes we call them um, cheese boards or graze boards, but charcuterie has uh, really been used to be the center of parties and the center of conversa uh, conversation at events and gatherings. Queso wants to change that narrative by making cheese and charcuterie more accessible and enjoyable in casual occasions. So the problem at hand is that 83% of Americans say traditional fast food just isn't healthy enough. Um, and 75% of Americans said they prefer fresher and quality eating um, with high quality, locally sourced and organic foods. Consumers also want companies to understand their expectations and, um, and their needs. So around 52% of customers expect all offers at restaurants to be personalized. Um, and this just shows that the, um, the one size fits all approach just isn't cutting it, especially in the food industry. So the solution is Queso, a fast casual charcuterie restaurant um, where the cheese boards are made right in front of you, creating a unique experience with every visit. Imagine the mod pizza or chipotle of a charcuterie. You come in, select a size off the menu, and customize how you see fit. We also offer large platters if you don't want to come empty-handed to a party or gathering. Um, with our very easy mobile ordering, um, there's no hassle. So instead of bringing a boring casserole or a boring store-bought uh, cheesecake, you can come with a beautiful, eye-catching cheese board. Queso will also offer easy online mobile ordering with a reward loyalty, loyalty reward system. 
So our total addressable market um, globally for the fast casual space is $150 billion and the CAGR is 12.4%. Our, our serviceable available market is $35 billion in the U.S. Um, and our SOM is estimated to be $4.2 billion. This is um, estimated by the segmentation of types of fast casual cuisines. So our target market um, includes young professionals and millennials. Um, young professionals make up around 46% of uh, fast casual consumers and millennials aren't just buying breakfast, lunch, and dinner. They're also paying for a uh, experience. This age group also wants to capture picture perfect moments um, and picture perfect foods on Instagram and TikTok. Um, on the flip side, baby boomers make up around 26% of fast casual uh, goers. So it's shown that boomers are willing to pay more for what they expect to be quality and good food. Okay, so our competition includes Gray's Craze, local charcuterie businesses, and fast casual chain restaurants. So for local um, and small charcuterie businesses, many of them are ran part-time, and you need to order anywhere from 24 to 76 hours ahead of time, and that's if there's availability. So accessibility is a major hurdle um, when ordering from them. I know because I used to run a small charcuterie business and I would be making charcuterie boards at 5 a.m. in the morning um, all the way up to midnight. Um, Gray's, Craze, Gray's Craze is a major charcuterie operation with around 20 operations um, or locations uh, nationwide and they operate by pickups and deliveries. So a majority of their business model is through corporate um, through corporate accounts and you can't customize their products. And for fast casual chain restaurants, the customization aspect really depends on the um, chain itself. Um, and personalization really um, is really hard for them, it is really difficult for them to achieve, especially with the smaller chains. And as you can see, um, Queso checks all the boxes. So cost customers want to feel important and valued because they are, and um, we can achieve this by by, through the, by the order history and preferences from the mobile app. This could also, be, this is, this could also mean recalling their previous orders and allowing them to reorder within seconds. The customer should also feel that they are in control. Rather than bombarding them with a whole bunch of um, options on the menu, we can narrow their, um, their, preferences, their preferences down and you know, show them the cheeses and meats that they probably like based off their um, last orders. So we are currently raising $300,000 and the majority of that will be used towards building improvements and equipment for our first location. At a glance, our um, store one projections, um, we begin to have positive cash flow in month 14 and from 2025 to 2028, our profit margin averages 13%. Our goal is to be within the 800 to $1,000 uh, sales per square foot um, range so that we're sure that we're maximizing our revenue um, in each location. We also wanna make sure that our food cost percentage stays within that 30% range and that our labor costs stay around 30 to 35%. All right, so our go-to-market plan includes building connections and relationships with suppliers like Merlino's, Cisco, and local charcuterie uh, cheese companies. We also wanna establish queso at local wineries and breweries. We plan to open our first location in the greater Seattle area during year one. And in year one through two, we want to make sure that we have a solid foundation so that we can scale in year three. Queso wants to carve out a niche in the fast casual market. And um, it can be challenging, especially with um, a new concept. So we first have to educate um, the public about what we actually do and who we are. Pizza, burgers, and Mexican foods, they're long, um, well-established niches in the restaurant space. So it really is getting people to, um, getting them more familiar with charcuterie boards. Um, majority of people know or have, have had a charcuterie board, but the, um, the concept still is new and a lot of people can't even pronounce it like myself. Um, but getting it right takes careful planning, um, analysis and just thoughtful consideration of you know scaling, growing, and um, making sure we have everything right. So after year two, we want to scale by opening a location every year um, on every year um, after year two along the west coast.
All right, so since being founded in July of 2020, we've participated in the Northwest Entrepreneurship Competition where we placed third and where we won the People's Choice Award. And we've also participated in the WSU Business Plan Competition and Sparks Weekend where we really worked on scalability, um, doing, conducting more market research and um, working on our business model. So these are the milestones that I've accomplished during the Jones Milestone um, Accelerator Program. And my biggest takeaway probably has to be the networking aspect. I've networked, we had to network around with around five new faces every week and it helped tremendously. Like my LinkedIn was like literally full of new connections and new, um, new people. Um, recently when I attended the restaurantology conference in Salt Lake City, I networked with a bunch of um, restaurateurs that really helped me um, understand scaling, funding, and staffing of a restaurant. Um, and after I graduate this fall, I will be working in the restaurant industry so I can gain better experience and knowledge of, um, of the industry. Lastly, I want to thank my mentors during the JMA, uh, Matt Mossman, Chef Jamie Callison, and Tiffany Stetson, and also Tiffany, Dr. Tiffany Reese and Marie Mays. And also a special thanks to the Herbert B. Jones Foundation. And remember what Chipotle did to Mexican food, charcuterie, uh, queso wants to do to charcuterie. Thank you for your time. <laughs> So I'm curious, when you think about expanding and getting new locations, do you want to do the franchise model? Do you want to franchise this out, like a Chick-fil-A, or do you want to own all the different operations? Yeah, so um, I've definitely looked at both the franchising model and um, you know corporate owned. And uh, when I did the Sparks Weekend, we were thinking we were thinking about doing the franchise model, but um, I really think the corporate owned model is the best. Um, keeping our values and keeping everything. Um, in line, I feel like with a lot of corporate owned, um, I mean, not corporate, with a lot of franchise um, companies, it can kind of get uh, messy with, um, you know, all the different uh, operators and fran franchisees. Huh? Yep. So your, your intro there, you said you kind of got are going by the uh, adult Lunchables thing. Uh, and yeah. That kind of got my mind spinning. Is that something that you'd think you'd do is do pre packages you know, partner with, you know, lo local stores, gas stations, things of that nature, so you can get your name out there, but not ne necessarily have to have people customize things and come to your uh, retail store? Yeah, definitely. So in the future, we definitely want to work with a food scientist and then work with a co-packer to get um, those adult Lunchables and retail stores like, you know, um, Safeway, Fred Meyers, et cetera. Um, that is further on in the business plan, though. So I was intrigued about your construction costs. Why not uh, lease and have tenant improvements on existing structures? Oh, um, yeah, so the um, the $300,000 would go towards the building and improvement, so that includes the lease, um, the tenant improvements. Okay. Yeah. Would you own your own buildings versus? Um, right now we're looking at um, leasing. Okay. Kind of along those same lines, uh, I think a lot of great, you know, little niche restaurants, kind of like yourself, started with a food truck mm -hmm. and going food truck route, doing a bunch of those and then expanding into little, um, you know, buildings as well. Have you thought about that strategy at all? I have looked into a food truck, but um, looking at my target market, you know, a lot of the millennial, millennials and young professionals and the baby boomers, they frequent in um, suburban areas and metro areas. And I think especially with, um, I guess the style of charcuterie and you know being able to provide wine and beer, um, I think a storefront really is the way to go. I agree. <laughs> so you mentioned uh, you're thinking about opening your first store in Seattle. What was your reasoning for that location? Yeah, so the greater Seattle area is kind of why we chose. Um, we're looking at Woodenville, but as well at, um, also like Kirkland, Bellevue, Redmond area, or South Lake Union. And that really is just because of the disposable income and people already know what charcuterie is. It's not a new concept to them and um, they have that disposable income. A question about uh, the whole team. It looks like you're a solo entrepreneur. Um, where do you see needing the help and have you brought in like board of advisor type of people or thought about them? Yeah, for sure. So for the business plan competition, I actually had a, um, myself and two others, but then they've, um, 
uh, gone on to different ventures. And so uh, currently I'm working with um, a few mentors, one of them being uh, Dave, D David Mackey, who's part of Duet Kachina in Seattle, and he has five locations of that fast casual chain. So he's one of my um, advisors. He's been helping me look at the um, financials and just everything. I met him at Restaurantology and I worked with him there. So we've been in contact um, since then. And so currently, um, as well as trying to build a team that um, understands Queso and wants to be in Queso, um, I'm trying to get gain more knowledge of the industry myself. So once I graduate this December, I'm going to be working um, in the restaurant industry to gain more knowledge. Uh, two questions. One, do you want to do deliveries? And two, you know, what's going to be your average time to, to fulfill an order? Yeah. Um, you talked about competitors, you know, you got to do 24, 72 hours in advance. Do you guys think you can be faster? And is that a competitive advantage for you? Um, yeah. So to answer the first question about, um, was it about delivery delivery? Yeah. So we would be do, doing, uh, we would be doing delivery. Um, I think the best way to do delivery is through those, um, you know, like DoorDash, Uber Eats, et cetera. And, um, the second question was about um, the time, right? Yep. Yeah, so with our current competitors, like I said, like the local charcuterie businesses, a lot of them are ran part-time. So you have that 24 to 76 hour um, window, and that's if there's availability. Um, well, for the other fast casual chains, um, I think staying within that seven minute per like um, per line, getting you from the moment you order to the moment you pay, mm -hmm. is really important. 90% of fast casual restaurants stay within that seven minute um, range. So yeah, definitely being, um, faster than a seven minute range. Okay, yep. I love it. What do you think your uh, uh, average transaction will be in terms of dollars? What, what are we looking at? In yeah, for price? sure. So, um, Queso would be described as a fine fast casual, so not just a fast casual, but a fine fast casual restaurant. And so for fast casual restaurants, the average chicken number can be two and can range from anywhere from 13 to $16. And um, so for fine casual restaurants, it's 18 to 23. So ours is gonna be, uh, um, average is around 20 to 22. So it's well within the fine casual range. And do you plan on catering events like weddings? I'm getting married next year, <laughs> June 3rd, so. <laughs> so <help. laughs> okay. Um, yeah, definitely um, with the um, cater model. So catering would actually be around uh, 25 to 30% of our business. Um, we would definitely have, we already have a catering, rever uh, catering coordinator uh, like planned out and like the people we would employ just because catering and charcuterie really go hand in hand. A lot of folks want, um, want charcuterie at their weddings or corporate events. So that's definitely, that's definitely something that we'd be doing. So talking about the financing side, mm -hmm. clearly you're doing pitch competitions and that's fabulous. Um, what are you thinking as far as maybe debt financing? Um, debt financing, so at the moment we um, are an LLC, but I've definitely, um, so myself, I'm gonna put in the capital, but as um, speaking with my advisors and um, my mentors, I've thought about doing um, debt financing instead of giving equity away um, just because this I feel like this is like my little baby that I've been working on since <laughs> July of 2020 so um, you know just giving giving a piece of that away um, you know in the future definitely but I'm kind of hesitant now especially since I'm still in school and I haven't graduated yet no all right thank you for your time Okay, I'd like to last, uh, lastly introduce Hunter Patton, who is uh, Team Solar Blades. Yep. So back in January, I enrolled into the WSU Business Plan Competition, and I honestly had no clue of what uh, venture or even industry I wanted to pursue. So then I started doing some pretty in-depth research, and I, uh, I came across two really interesting facts. The first being that the energy industry will have the largest transfer or exchange of wealth of all time. The second being that the United States will be 48% reliant upon the solar industry. Once I found out those two, two key facts, I actually knew that I wanted a piece of the solar industry. So then I started thinking, how can I make solar better? How can I improve the efficiency? And that's when I came across solar panel cleaning. The photos above are, are pictures of solar panels that I cleaned this past summer. The one on the right is a dirty solar panel. It has water spots, dirt, and dust all over it. And the one on the left is the same exact solar panel after I cleaned it. The cleaning process was relatively simple. Essentially, all I did was take a, a, a mop and some water and then just brush all the dirt off. 
And as you can see that, you know, very minimal cleaning made a dramatic difference in at least the appearance of this solar panel. But I didn't necessarily clean these panels because I wanted to make them look good. I cleaned them because dirt, ash, or pollen can cause between an 18 to 22% efficiency drop in solar panel output. Now with residential arrays like I cleaned this past summer, you can see between a 40 to $100 loss of, loss of efficiency each year. Now I know this is a problem, but I didn't think this was a large enough problem for me to focus on, which is why I'm focused on grid scale solar farms, which can have up to 2,000 acres or 14,000 rows of solar panels. Now imagine cleaning 14,000 rows of solar panels by hand. This would take forever, right? <laughs> which is why my solution is an automatic solar panel cleaning system. My solution has two main components, the device and the docking station. The device, will the device will move along the rows horizontally. I'm projecting about one device per every 10 rows. The device will include a soft rotating brush and a water hose that will squirt water in front of the brush, followed by a squeegee which removes the water to, pre to prevent those hard water stains. The docking station uh, will be transportable, <clears throat> so it can easily be, be moved between rows. It'll also include a panel connection kit for charging the device, as well as a water tank stored in the bottom. Now I'm estimating this to cost $3,000 to produce. Now I haven't yet built an actual full-size prototype, so this is just a mere estimation. I'm estimating the base structure will cost $2,000. This includes the docking station, the motor, the brushes, the squeegee, the water tank, water pump, and hoses. I'm also estimating the controlling system to cost an additional $1,000. This includes the controller, the batteries, the charger, and the panel termination kit. Now to put this in a better perspective, I would really like to give you guys an example of a solar farm. This solar farm, which is located in California, has 2,000 acres, 14,000 rows, and 4 million panels. <clears throat> this solar farm also produces 702,000 megawatt hours each year. If we were to operate at a 20% efficiency loss due to dirt, it would lose 140,000 megawatt hours every year. I'm going to convert megawatt hours into kilowatt hours because that is what uh, that is what unit energy is sold in. So this solar farm is losing 140 million kilowatt hours each year. The average price of energy in California, which this solar farm is located in, is uh, 15 cents. So 15 cents times 140 million is 21 million dollars. So this solar farm is actually losing 21 million dollars a year if it only operates at 80 percent 80 percent efficiency. So how much, is this solar, how much would it cost this solar farm to be outfitted with my device? Well, I would charge a 3x markup, so $9,000 per unit. One unit per 10 rows is 1,400 units. 1,400 units times $9,000 is $12.6 million, which you can see is substantial. This is a lot less than the $21 million they are losing annually. So who are my customers? To answer this in the short version, it's the utility companies and solar developers. Every company is actually a little bit different. Usually there is someone who oversees these solar investments within these companies. All, and a lot of times solar design is actually outsourced to engineering firms. So, so how, I fit in, how I would fit in would be these engineering firms would design my product on new panels or panels that have already been established or already there. And then they would sell the design and the, engineer, or in the utility companies or solar developers would buy my product. <clears throat> Some notable utility companies uh, starting to build, starting to build grid, grid scale solar farms include Avista, Encore based out of Central Texas, Calcum Energy based out of Central California, as well as Austin Energy, and plenty of others. Next, I have my market size. Currently, there are over 3,000 farms in the United States. Now, this might seem a little bit capped, but remember, solar is just getting started. There are over 1,000 farms in the Southwest region. This is of importance to me because the Southwest region has the largest farms and also the farms that typically have the most need for cleaning. Now, my service bulletin will market, I'm projecting to be 50% of these Southwest farms because these farms are probably too big, or these farms are too big to, uh, to have manual cleaning teams clean them, as well as you can visibly see dirt on these, on these farms panels. Next, I have my three-year profit and loss projections. Now, the first year, I don't really expect to get business from the largest solar, solar panel farm in California. I'm only, I'm only actually projecting myself to sell 50 units. The reason why I have over a million dollars in net loss is because of costs associated with starting a business. Year two, I'm projecting myself to sell 100 units, netting my first profit of $290,000. Year three, I'm projecting myself to sell 200 units, netting a profit of nearly $900,000. I'd also like to mention that each of these years, I'm projecting to sell between one to 50 farms, as well as I calculated this net income before tax. 
Now you can't really have a great business without some great competitors. And I have, I have three main types. The first type being the other automatic cleaning solutions. This includes companies called Helotex and Solobots. The reason why I chose to present these companies, because there are many others, <clears throat> is because they have more, te more advanced technology and they honestly have a more well-rounded business than the, than the other competitors. The problem with these is that they're just not well established yet. This is still a new industry. The next competitor is tractors with cleaning arms. This includes synergy rigs as well as next automation. The problem with this solution is that sometimes the tractors are too big to fit between the panel rows, as well as it's a very time consuming pro process. Tr the tractors can only go so fast. Lastly is manual cleaning teams. And this is the most prevalent option, but it is also very time consuming. And when looking at a 14,000 row solar farm, by the time you get done cleaning the last row, you probably have to go back and clean the first row again. Now I have my go-to-market strategy, and I kind of broke this down into about five different phases. The first phase is to acquire funding. With my initial funding, I plan to do some product development. I currently have a miniature prototype built, um, but I would actually like to get a full-size prototype built and test it on solar farms in my area. Next, I need to gain approval from, from solar panel manufacturers. Um, currently, I'm in contact with, with uh, Mission Solar, who's the second largest solar manufacturer in the US, as well as other manufacturers who actually build solar panel tilt kits, automatic solar panel tilt kits. Next, I need to establish distribution channels and uh, manufacturing. And lastly, which I think is my hardest phase, is marketing and customer acquisition. <clears throat> lastly, I would like to talk about my Jones Milestone ex Accelerator experience. From visiting solar farms, to applying to grants, to creating my own website, the least I can say is this process was not easy. And I definitely learned a lot from it. I was actually asked to take, pick one key takeaway from this entire experience, and that would be the connections and network I made. I think I started the summer off with about 20 followers on LinkedIn, and I got, that, I got it up to 250. And also developed relationships with uh, other solar industry professionals as well as other entrepreneurs. I'd also like to thank my, thank my teammates, Isabel Bates and Brandon Fulmer for really helping me design as well as build my prototype. And I would like to thank the program director, Dr. Tiffany Reese, Marie Mays, my advisors, Andy Barrett, Deshaun Aurora, and then Ernest Spicer. And I also would like to thank the JMA sponsors, the Herbert B. Jones Foundation, as well as Leon Hayes. Thank you. So you talked a little bit about competitors and like the current cleaning solutions. How often are they cleaning the farms currently? Um, and how often are like manual teams doing it? And then how often do you think, sorry, that's a lot of questions. Yeah, there you go. How often do you think your solution will be, need to be used? Um, so honestly, like if the farms buy my product, the product's gonna sit there and clean every night. So they'll never have, a, the panels will never have a chance of getting dirty. Mm -hmm. Currently, um, they're cleaning the panels, but not quite enough. I mean, most of the solar farms around here, at least, do not clean their solar panels at all. Um, but especially in like the Southwest region of the United States where you, um, it's hotter, it's drier, and uh, you typically see more dirt and dust and even like maybe ash or pollen accumulated on the panels. Um, I'd say they probably at least clean it twice a year. So just not enough. Oh, gee. Yeah. Oof. So also along the competitor analysis side of things, how much do the competitors cost that were the top two that are automated? Yeah, so their units are range between about nine thousand to about twelve thousand dollars a piece. Okay, so you'd be in about the same yeah. price range. And then, um, do theirs require water tanks and hoses? Yes, uh, there are a few others I didn't list, and I'd say it's about fifty-fifty. Some do and some don't. Um, okay. it's, but it's definitely a, a problem we all have to work around in a, when cleaning these panels. Good to see you again. I've heard this Thanks. pitch several times. Oh, yeah. uh, it's been a ton of growth, so it's been uh, awesome to see Thank again. You. <laughs> um, one thing that I know you've answered before, which I wanted to ask again, because okay. some people might have not heard the, uh, the answer to this, is snow removal. Is this something that you're planning to pivot into? Because especially if you're going after a Vista, obviously snow is a much more significant reduction in uh, the capacity for those solar panels than the dust. Yeah, actually when I st first started with this idea, I that's what I was focused on was snow, because I know when snow covers solar panels, they, their efficiency drops to zero. But um, during the winter, their efficiency is already a lot less than what it is during the summer. So I guess it would, it would, it's just a whole nother problem snow is. So I'm not necessarily focused on it right now, but I, I am thinking about pivoting towards back towards that eventually. 
So with your prototype and design, do you have freedom to operate or do those other competitors have IP claims that would be stepped <laughs> on? And, um, and with your design, it looks like the IP is really critical. Where are you at in that process? Yeah, it, it is really critical. And that's one of my that's one of my main goals is to actually file for a patent. I did a, um, a patent search over the summer. It was actually one of my milestones. Um, and there are quite a few of them. They're, they are really um, technical. So I think I, oh, I know I can work around them eventually. Now, when starting out, did you ever think about doing like a smaller device for residential properties, you know, people's houses, things like that? Or you just go on the enterprise route after the big money of the, the solar Yeah, farms? so when I first started out, it, it was for residential. And uh, when I went up to Sparks Weekend with Connor, um, our, my team actually decided to pivot towards grid scale solar because you're right, you know, that's where all the money's at. And these farms are popping up everywhere. What is your? What are the next steps in terms of engineering this thing? What's, what does the roadmap look like for that? Um, I see you have Andy Barrett. I know you were meeting with uh, Andy Johnson too. Yeah. What, is, what are the next steps there? Honestly, I'm not an, I'm not an engineer, which is why I am, I am meeting with Andy Barrett and Andy Johnston, and I also have two engineers on my team. So it's not particularly a question um, that I can answer with 100% certainty. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Okay. Um, so kind of along the same lines, yeah. cost of servicing, it's one thing to sell it, it's another thing to maintain it. Yeah, that's true. And, and uh, um, I think that's how we're going to get a re recurring cost eventually is maintaining these devices. Sweet. Um, talk about, you know, you talk about partnering with manufacturers. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's a key element that you have to do or, and do you see it as them like offering your service when solar farms buy them or how do you look at that? Yeah. I mean, so for, for me right now, I'm a college student. I don't necessarily have any money. These guys, you know, they've been out there for a while. They have the money and yeah. I feel like partnering them is one route that I could take. And it's been the, the route that I've been looking at so far. I think it'd be smart. Yeah. Thank you. I guess one last question. Yeah. Um, just talk about like, what would the onboarding look like? How long would it take when someone buys? You know, how long do you think it would take for them to get set up and operating? I mean, so for like a 4 million panel farm, it'd probably take ab about three or four months to, to get it fully operated, depending on how big of a crew we have out there um, installing these. So yeah, I just point out, I think you could do like a couple rows, like you said. Yeah. Uh, you could even offer them for free. Yeah. Um, and definitely. then if you can get a contract for those larger farms, that's big money. Yeah, definitely. That's what I'm looking forward to. <laughs> Are we good? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Okay, um, give us just a few minutes before you uh, jump up and grab some food because um, we need to tally the results. I'd like to announce the winner of the JMA pitch competition for 2022 is Team Queso. You gotta be right in front of it. Right Official. <laughs> Official. <laughs> nice job. Congratulations. Well done. We'll take a picture after. Okay. Um, so uh, again, just just another minute. We can eat. I know we're all we're all getting all want to eat. Um, we also want to talk a little bit about the business plan competition uh, 2023. Uh, the resource nights and the business plus business plan competition workshops start at the end of uh, January. So for those of you interested in um, being part of the business plan competition, which is really how all of most of these teams got started um, to be part of this Jen's Milestone Accelerator. Um, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Pelion Ventures, um, Leon Hayes, uh, and uh, many other sponsors. Many, many others. And I'd like to thank Liridana for um, for popping in today, for Savannah for being here today since 8 a.m. Um, and uh, the teams, as well as the judges and the mentors. We couldn't do any of this without you all. So uh, we really appreciate your time and efforts that you uh, uh, that you've given us. We wouldn't we wouldn't be able to do this without you. So. Um, Oh, social. Social. Yeah. So, so how you find out about more events like this, follow us on social media. Um, 
Nikki Garcia runs our socials and Savannah helps out. And so it's, it's definitely cooler. It's not like we don't run the socials, So uh, <laughs> you want to, you definitely want to follow. And then for those of you who need a uh, career Carson career amplifier program credit, uh, we've got that here. There's so. the QR code there. So yeah. everybody can whip out their phones and get credit for that. Okay. So, all right. All right. Thank you everyone. Um, enjoy some, uh, delicious, snacks and thanks so much for coming and go kooks, go kooks. yeah uh -huh.